This time on Graveyard Cars. We're all hard at work on the 1970 Plymouth Superbird. Derek hooks up the headlights, Larry installs the headliner, and we bolt up the engine, transmission, and drivetrain. The bodymen finish up mud work, paint, and assembly on the 1970 Charger RT Collision Repair. Mark bolts on the manifolds and paints the 383 engine for Cook's 1970 Barracuda convertible. And with Mark as my accomplice, I commit grand larceny on this episode of Graveyard Cars. Got that car coming to get you, Barbara. I'm Mark Warman, and together with the most critical man in the world, Darren Kirkpatrick. Give me a gun! My son-in-law, Josh. Oh, yeah! And my best friend, Roy. Well, all right! We bring dead muscle cars back to life, to exactly the way they were on the day they were born. If we don't kill each other. There. Oh. Oh. It's gonna be a bloodbath. Right now we got a ton of things going on at Graveyard Cars. We're moving a lot of stuff into the new building, things that we won't need here. That's engines, transmissions, rear ends, parts, miscellaneous, things like that. We still have our 1970 Dodge Charger RT that has to be buttoned up and on a truck in the next week or so to get back to the guy in Oklahoma because he's chomping at the bit to get that car back. The Superbird, running out of time on it. Still have a ton to go on it before the hills get here and they're gonna be here very, very soon. The good news is I have Derek as my right-hand man who I can count on to come through in a pinch and he's doing a remarkable job of getting stuff done on that car. We're uh, undercoating the Superbird, which is not a major thing. We just gotta mask everything off. We do not want undercoating on. because it's thick, gooey, and it's not fun to clean off, so. You just want to take your time, mask it off once, do a good job so you can just undercoat it and be done. Almost all the cars at Graveyard Cars now get undercoated when they're done. Once the body and the paint's done on them, that's a good time to seal the bottom of them up. We've been using the International Automotive Value Guard. Works really well. You can shoot it on with a shoots gun. But the main thing is it penetrates and bites the metal better than the other products that I've used. The main purpose behind undercoating is to protect the bottom of it, so I like that product because it actually does stick on the car and it does protect it from the elements as good or better than anything on the market. Today the guys and I are getting ready to marry together the engine transmission, drive shaft, torsion bars, basically the drivetrain for the 70 Superbird. First, we have to get it moved outside and washed. The wet sand and the buff is done on it, but it's just filthy from the wet sand and buff. So we want to take the Aladdin, give it a nice wash, get it dried off, move it inside. We're ready to make history. That's what we do. So my job is whenever we get a car outside, thank God for this nice, beautiful day, I'm in charge of getting all the compound off the car, inside the car, everywhere underneath the car. This car is gonna go back inside with zero compound. You know, and this pressure washer that we have is, it's amazing and I can get the job done in like five minutes. Get some wet. Hey, hey, hey. Just oh, fire, aren't you? You got the inside? Oh! God! Sorry, bro. No. Now, you got you to talk care, me. Man. Is that what it is? You don't care. Well, Mark, you don't care if you get people wet. Here's another great example of me as the voice of reason and everybody else escalating things to the child level. I didn't get him wet. I stuck a pole up his ass. Okay? Well, that's nice. Pull this right is down. about retaliation for my friend. Well, no. <laughs> you want to go, mother? <laughs> I will put you down. I'll euthanize you. Yeah, get, get a whip. I'll, I'll come at you. I'll do it. I'll do, <laughs> do it, it Nancy. Don't do it, Vince. 
I want to get the car done. I got Darren over there with a whip threatening to whip me. Each guy snapping each other with towels like this is the locker room in ninth grade. You do it again. I'm going to whip you. You do it again. I'll whip you. I promise. I will if you spray me one more time. Whip me, big boy. Whip me. No, if you spray me. Do it, Darren. No, not unless he sprays him. Child. There's <laughs> your right hand. Rubber hammer. Royal, that ain't starting. Here's the thing with Royal. I've known him since I was 13 years old. He knows I have a tool. But by asking it, the mere asking of it makes you go get it. You've been doing a lot of that lately. What? Like, like you're a surgeon and I'm your nurse. I'm not, you don't Yeah. Just, you think there's a lot of bald, fat, middle-aged loser surgeons? I don't think George Costanza is a cardiothoracic surgeon. You will say rubber mallet and I run over and get it and, and then repeat the Look, words. man, come on, it's team. Crazy be part that. of the Don't be such an ass. You got a hammer? Yeah, it's in the toolbox. It's right over there. Go get it. But that's his way of getting you to be his slave. Get off your fat ass and go over and get it yourself. You're fine. Well, he, uh, when I went for that hammer, I'm thinking, wow, it'd be kind of funny to black out a couple of his teeth in this picture and see how long it takes him to notice. So I asked him for a black Sharpie. He went and got me one. I didn't hide it. I just, he gave me the Sharpie. I opened it, turned around, coated a couple of teeth, and we'll see how long it takes for him to notice. I thought I was a Mopar guy. Thought you were too. I don't know, buddy. Right now, we're still in the beginning stages of uh, putting the engine and transmission in the Superbird, but we do have a lot of things out of the way. The upper control arms are in place. The motor and the transmission are now on a rolling dolly, moved underneath the car. It's all in position. We're ready to set it down and join the two together. So I think from here, it's really, it's, it's one, two, three. It's what we do all the time. It should go really smooth. That's a B-body leaf spring. This is a leaf spring out of a truck. Don't touch my picture. You owe me $9.95. Hold up. Whoa, stop. Derek got the undercoating applied to Mike Hill's 1970 Superbird. Despite the guys screwing around, we got the Superbird cleaned up and on the bin pack. The engine and transmission, along with the suspension, are put together and on a rolling dolly, ready to go into the Superbird. Hold up, whoa, stop. Guide that shock in over there, Darren. We're getting ready to lower the car down onto the motor. Mark's got the shocks on them. Everything's built out. They're always a tight fit, but with the shocks on there, it's just something else we gotta watch as it's going together. We don't wanna have to paint anything else now. What's that? Look up above. Bit, huh? Look up above. Okay. I got a problem with this manifold and okay. the steering gear. Okay. I mean, it's like the steering gear sticking over into the rail like a half inch. It's almost like the motor's got to roll to get it to fit up in there. We're just trying to figure out the best way to get it in there. I think so. Okay. So you want to yard it forward? Yep. <laughs> My bad. How's that? Uh, the only real problem we're having marrying the two together is that it's a really tight fit. Sometimes it will just glide between the right hand exhaust manifold and the steering gear, and in this case, it didn't for whatever reason. Sometimes maybe there's a little more play in the steering gear mounting holes and we have this one too far out. But what we really need to do is just angle it a little bit and get that right manifold past the shock tower, then it would just slide down. I truly believe now though, gentlemen, yeah, it can go to the, the I think it can go to the right is what I was gonna say. I think it's gonna be inevitable to no. scratch it. It's not inevitable. I just think if this comes over, it'll clear. Okay, well now it's clear. <laughs> That's why I was saying it just needed to come over this way. Okay, go up. One more. One more? Yep. Yeah. We're green light go, sir. We're green light go. You go right here. As far back as you can go. Okay, that's good. Despite the problems we had orchestrating the installation of the engine and transmission, I'm optimistic that the rear axle will go much smoother. I mean, we have done it a few times. 
This should be a piece of cake. Stop there. Look at that. You got yours, Joshy? Just about. Hang on there. Oh, right there. You lost the gasket there, buddy. <laughs> Crazy. Dude. <laughs> Come on, Picasso. Out, buddy. Well, are we going home now? Huh? Are we going home now? Yep. Let's go. Where's this go? F you. Who did that? <laughs> <laughs> Who did that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I really didn't think you would notice that quick. I should have known the way he looks at his picture all the time and watches himself on the TV. Did you do it? <laughs> Did you? <laughs> That's what I needed the pen for. You got me the pen. Yeah, oh, you're trapped, bro. You got me the pen. <laughs> <laughs> royalty man. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't touch no, my no, picture. No, you owe no. me $9.95. Just don't mess with it. Mondo fix one. it on my <laughs> <laughs> when you walk over to somebody else's property, such as my toolbox, and you open it up, and you desecrate a very famous, a very popular photograph of me, I think that you suggest to your peers your own mentality. That's awesome. You look like Mr. Ed. You know, for the guy, the owner of the toolbox, to open up the door and see his own face, like, that's sick. I'm glad Royal did it, and hopefully even put Mark in check. I think that while my teeth may be the one blacked out in the picture, his teeth are the ones that get blacked out when you think about him in the real world doing his thing. F all y'all. Piece of inbred hillbilly I like it. Toothless and ruthless. The collision job on the charger is moving along. Once the sheet metal is on and welded up in the factory places, then it's time to do the cosmetic work, which is the plastic filler over all the panels. Make sure that they're square, that they're straight, that you've got good gaps. Then you're ready to primer them. Uh, that'll be what comes up next after the primer gets blocked, then reprimed, then reblocked, and ready for the subline green paint. One of the things that I will stray away from from the OEM appearance is the finish of the paint. An original manufactured car, it was done in a single stage enamel. It was real orange peely. It had runs, it had transparent spots where the robot didn't get enough paint on it. If you're building a car to be judged an OE class, then that would be the way you would do it. But most of my clients, all of my clients to date, have preferred to have a better paint, a better finish on it than what it would have been OEM. So, uh, whenever I can, that's the finish I like to put on a car. You know, I'm pretty fortunate right now. I've got good body men working here. I've got good painters. I've got good assembly guys. I can turn a certain department loose like that and know that when it comes out of there, that it's square, that it's straight, that it's flat. I'm fortunate to have a, a good group of guys working here. True or false? Chrysler's bulletproof automatic transmission is called the Torque Box. Stay tuned after the break for the answer. So, did Chrysler call their automatic transmission the Torque Box? The answer is false. The real name for the automatic transmission, both in the 904 and the 727, is Torque Flight. A Torque Box refers to an area in the substructure of a unibody car that ties the unibody together with the floor of the car. Visit GraveyardCars.com to learn more. Even though Chrome Dome thought it'd be funny to destroy my own personal property, we still managed to get the engine, transmission, and drivetrain installed in the Hill 70 Superbird. Now I can finish installing the manifold on the Cooks 383 engine so we can get it painted. Look, like the little mice have been building a little nest in here, huh? Yep. Wow. 
Most of the cars we drag in has had some kind of creature in it. A uh, while back, Josh and I had finished assembling Kimberly Cook's little 383 two-barrel engine. Uh, I hadn't had a chance to paint it in the last couple of weeks because I'd just been busy on other cars, but I'm glad I didn't because I had forgot she was changing it over to a dual exhaust. Uh, I went out and rounded up a pair of exhaust manifolds that are the HP manifolds that would be correct if it had been a dual exhaust HP engine. And that's what Tweedledum and I are getting ready to put on so we can get this thing in the booth and paint it. It looked like a good manifold, so I'm hoping. Are the other manifolds cracked? Yep. Both of them? The first one I got, the first one I got I had uh, out in one of the pods I forgot about, this one here, but it actually has a crack in it. Um, the back side, I think. Yeah right there. So I heated it up earlier to see that it was actually cracked. So I can have that welded up later and use that on a different car, but Kimberly's I want to be really nice. The thing so. mine was, you take the manifolds off I would have took them off. Of Put those back on. Absolutely I would have. Mine was cracked to begin with, What's right? What's the problem? No problem. Why don't you just burn the bolts off? Because they should unbolt. You're starting to modify these cars more and more, aren't you? Nope, I'm sure not, Darren. I'm just doing what the customer you asked. Put new exhaust on the last couple. Yeah, that's because that's what the customer wanted. Anybody can modify and butcher these cars and adapt them. It takes true craftsmen to bring the car back to what they were originally. Yeah, I can see the tide changing here at GUIC Mark. At first, just all OEM, 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 OEM. Darren loves picking. All, that's all this is, is, is the car's not OEM. And if I had put single exhaust back on it, he would have said, why didn't you put dual exhaust on it? You need to be on one thing, either OEM or modified. No, Darren, it's not how they came from the factory. I thought you knew that. I thought you were a Mopar guy. Well, I am. How many 3 2 barrels had dual exhaust? How many 318 2 barrels had dual exhaust? What are you doing? Just watching. Sandblast that. Please. Do it or I'll kick your spleen in. We don't have any. We're going to media blast it. I don't give a what you do. Hey, Mark, you think I could paint that I engine? I want that thing in two minutes. Do you think I could paint the engine? Seriously? Absolutely not. Why? You should let me try. It might do better than you. You know what? I was practicing when I was eight years old. What were you doing? Come on, we need to get that thing. Why are you taking a water break? I think you should let me paint the engine, don't you? I think so. He's afraid that I'd be better than him. Yeah, if I hadn't taken my car out of here, this manifold would have been off mine. OK, blow it out. Let's put it on. It's cracked. It's cracked. Right there, see it? That's the last one. Except for the one We've on used car. every single one. Do you have one on your car? Yeah, we're not taking it off. I'll hook up the exhaust and everything. Dang it, it's just same old <laughs> Why in the <laughs> are these? I went through a hundred of them well, and never this. had that must one be a, crack. That's the same spot. Look at that. It's got to be a weak point. Look at that. I put a lot of the 383, 440HP manifolds on. I've had an occasional crack one, but right now I'm just running through a slew of them. The engine needs to be painted with that manifold on there. I can call Tony D'Agostino, he'll have it in stock, I can guarantee you that, but it's still gonna be three to five days away unless I wanna pay some ridiculous amount of shipping, which I don't. So it creates a real problem. I'm telling you right now, if Tony can't get me one in the next couple of days, I'm taking the one off your car. No, you're not. Yeah, I most no, certainly you're not. am. Your car's in Josh's garage. You're not getting my manifold and exhaust and everything's all hooked up You to don't it. need it. You're I never going to do the car. Darren's not going to know, all right? This car's out of Josh's house in the first place, so he doesn't even know. He's never going to work on the car, all right? So I'm just going to take one of the broken manifolds and put it on there in case the unlikely of any goes and looks, because the crack won't be able to see it once it's on there. Take his manifolds so I can get Kimberly's engine painted. You know what I'm saying? Darren's that guy, he doesn't understand. You can't go to him and say, hey, dude, can I borrow your manifold for a couple of days? Oh, no, you're not, my It's just easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission with him. You know what I'm saying? What are you talking about? What? What are you talking about? Oh. OK. Getting ready to install the headlight doors and buckets in the uh, 70 Superbird, which is going to be, yeah, lots of fun. Let's just get it done. With any luck, Darren and Royal would show up and help, but we're not gonna hold our breath on that today. It's not really hard, it's just time consuming. Everything you move one side and you're adjusting the other and then it's back and forth. And it just eats up quite a bit of time, part of the day. And they're not like it's something we do every day. It's a Superbird or Daytona only part, so. This assembly has to fit in here from the back. Fits in once it's roughly in place, 
We have three bolts, nuts on each side, which allows this headlight door to come six different directions, basically, in, out, up, down, tilted to the front, whatnot. So just gotta get it bolted in, move it around, and back and forth until you get it to where it fits the opening nice and centered, opens without hitting, catching the nose cone. Almost every Mopar muscle car has some key element that really makes the car. Uh, in the case of the Superbird, the vacuum operated hideaway headlights, very cool feature. They need to work, they need to fit in the opening. It's kind of one of those moments for Derek because he had to hand fabricate two thirds of this front nose piece out of, out of steel. So to have everything go in there and to have it actually work is going to be a huge kudo to him. This isn't a factory tab. Somebody welded, MIG welded that on there. I don't consider that magic, necessarily. There are certain things that are just a lot of fun for me to see. We've got the shop over there with an upstairs with three different rooms that we're gonna have. One of them's already done. It has a couple of walls still to finish in it, but that's gonna be the Mr. Mopart's room. Hi, I'm Mike Chunfont. And I'm Mark Chunfont. And collectively, we own MrMoparts.net. We have been providing automotive restoration parts for the Mopar industry for over 20 years now. We're basically running about anywhere from 10 to 12,000 different fasteners for the Chrysler, GM, and Ford also. Used to, we had to go out in the boneyard, find a bolt, screw, nut, bracket, whatever, and, and blast it, clean it, paint it, coat it, whatever you need to do with it. Now we're just gonna go into the room, get whatever part we need, brand spanking new. It's gonna be so nice, the car's gonna turn out better, and we're gonna be a lot more productive. The guys came out from Mr. Mopart's and did a phenomenal job. They not only came out, bought the pegboard, hung the pegboard, took me out to dinner because Darren says he, they always have to take us out to dinner for some strange reason, gave us thousands of dollars worth of inventory that we're going to be able to use on a day-by-day -day basis out here that normally when you run out of a paint gasket kit or you forget about it, now we can just walk into the room, pick it up, so we are one step closer to being an assembly line. Mr. Mike Hill's 1970 Plymouth Superbird is coming along beautifully. With the undercoating applied, the complete drivetrain and suspension installed, and Derek finishing the headlights, it's finally starting to look like a Superbird. The technicians have finished up all of the bodywork on the 1970 Charger RT collision repair. Darren discovered yet another cracked manifold on the Cook's Barracuda. I may or may not have actually told Josh where he could find one that doesn't have a crack in it. So right now, I am at my house. I'm getting ready to pull the exhaust manifold off of Darren's car. Darren constantly bitches about the condition of his car that it's not getting worked on. But let me tell you something, 10 years, 10 years he's had that car. I have helped him. We have gone through the panic modes where we get it running. I just want to get it running, buddy. And I'll drop everything. We'll pull it in. We'll get it running, get it moving under its own power. And then it just sits out back again for months and years at a time. Hey, buddy. Mark gave me the okay. Kind of sounds a little sketchy, but whatever. I'm just gonna yank it off, take it down to the shop. Apparently we need it for something because every single one that we have has a crack in it. And the only one good that we can find within like a 2,000 mile radius is Darren's. And the reason my car had to be moved to Josh's house because Mark was constantly stealing and pilfering parts off my car and never returning them. You know, I'm just gonna pull this thing off, give it to Mark. I don't want no more part of it. I've got parts he's borrowed five, six, seven, eight years ago. He's never returned to this date. You know, I don't wanna be in, be caught in the middle of some kind of crossfire because if that's the case, I'm gonna roll this thing out in the middle of the intersection. First person to grab it and take it can keep it. If you're not struggling, you're not doing it right. If it comes off way too easy, you've done it wrong. Darren's motor is leaning this way more than that way. I have every socket but the right one. Oh, that hurt, dude. Oh, shouldn't be me here doing this. I would be so pissed off if this one has a crack. Darren's original exhaust manifold. Looks great. Probably one in the, the, the best condition that I've ever seen there at the shop. I guess we can head back. Nice. Nice. 
Oh, you don't well, want to be the guy to put it on? Nah, he was cool with it. I, was he cool with it, bro? <laughs> Would I tell you he wasn't cool with it? If, well, you asked me, am I, a, am I a thief? Okay, I don't think there's a lot of thieves that rob banks that plan on giving the cash back. <laughs> All right, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I'm gonna order him a pair of HP exhaust mantles from AMD. And by the time he figures it out, because it takes him years to get out there and check it, he can't be mad because I already got him a brand new pair. You see, there's a method to my madness. Yes, there is. I borrowed the manifold so that I could finish a very important customer's car. This is about the customer. We should be coming together as a group for the good of the company, you know? You just gotta trust me. I got everything handled. There's nothing you know, to worry I... about. Okay, when you go to put that on, you usually gotta give it, like these get a little bit banged up. Okay. Because they're just tin. Right. So try to get that to, if you need to force it on there, you can do that. There you go. Didn't it just go on? Yep. Okay. Like that wire drops down there, feeds there, and then right into it. That's what I think. And the front one's a four split. See? Just like that. These are the special long nuts, the sleeve nuts, they call them. See, there's threads in there because these manifolds have a hole in them. Here, you see the manifold's exposed. You just put a nut on it. But back here, if you want to try to put a nut on it, how are you ever going to get a socket on it? You're not. So you have to put this in there. That's a factory Mopar deal there. Now, the original ones, at least on the ones that come off most of these, did not have these threaded holes in them. So, yeah, I noticed on Darren's they were just regular. There. Yeah. Now just remember you want to do this. You want to straighten these back out once you get the manifold on, or you'll have a hell of a time putting your uh, plug wires on, right? And then let me show you something. See these plugs? They were in at the factory, and they just taped off the electrode on the end. So anybody that gives you crap about why is he doing all that, why is he putting on all this stuff, the manifold, it's all factory. You can run those down, and then we miraculously We'll be ready to roll it in the booth and paint it. Chrysler Corporate Blue. Let's roll it in there, monkey. Ooh, ooh. So what I'm doing is I'm mixing up the black right now to be able to paint the uh, engine with an epoxy primer. This has a little bit of phosphoric acid. It's the DP90 by PPG. You've seen me use it before. This old take care of any flash rusting that started on the block. Plus, it'll give it a really good bite, and it works like a primer sealer. I've been painting cars for 25, 30 years. That means everything. That means not only blocking the cars and getting them ready and making sure that they're massaged to perfection, but actually laying that paint out, laying the base coat, laying the clear, laying the single stage out. Painting is painting, all right? A lot of people get all choked up when they go in the booth and they've got, you know, a $500 a gallon or $1,000 a gallon paint and a gun that costs $2,000 getting ready to shoot a $5,000 engine. It's child's play to me. It's like the drive-up window of Mickey D's, you know? You want, the, you want the Happy Meal with or without the little action figure, all right? I go in that booth and it's business as usual for me, all right? I've invented some new different techniques. All right, I think it's, uh, if you've ever seen The Color of Money with Tom Cruise, all right, when the song Werewolf of London starts playing and he's doing all the crazy hijinks with it, that's all I'm doing in there. I'm just having a little bit of fun. And at the same time, I'm still laying out uh, one of the best paint jobs that an engine could ever receive. You know, I, I don't consider that magic necessarily. I mean, I'm, I'm not a wizard, okay? I'm just a person laying some paint out on a car that happens to be able to do a two and a half uh, turn reverse on a moonwalk at 60 pounds of air pressure. Now you decide. The world famous Mopar pistol grip shifter was first introduced in 1969, 1970, or 1971. The answer coming up after the break. So what year was the famous pistol grip shifter first introduced in a Mopar muscle car? The answer is 1970. 
Prior to 1970, most of the cars, the muscle cars, had a straight chrome shifter with a ball on the top. We changed them out as kids and put T-handles on them and crazy eight balls and things like that, but that was the shifter we had. It wasn't until 1970 when Chrysler revolutionized shifters by introducing the Hurst pistol grip shifter with the simulated wood grain handles. Visit GraveyardCars.com to learn more. With the drivetrain and headlights installed, our Superbird is looking gorgeous. Long Turd somehow found a manifold around here that didn't have a crack on it. I got the manifolds installed and the engine painted for the 383. Now I got to sign off on the charger so it can get jam work. getting ready to do jam work on this car. So I'm just kind of giving it a once over to make sure it's actually ready to spray. That's where they do the insides of the door jams, inside of this jam, inside of here. Looks good, looks a lot better. Whoever had this car before just butchered the crap out of it. I'm working on the Dana right now. I just had to call the guy and tell him that it's not an original B-body Dana, it's actually out of a truck. The Dana 60 came in a lot of trucks, and they were very cheap. You could buy a Dana 60 out of a Ford F-250 for $100, where one of these for a real B-body was two grand, three grand for the rear end. So here's the rear end that came out of the car. The car is an original 410 Dana car, but this isn't an original 410 Dana. In the case of the Dana rear end under the Charger, um, I don't know if when the owner bought the car if he knew that it was just a truck rear end. The Dana 60 came underneath a lot of trucks. The difference is between a car one, a car Dana, and a truck Dana is that the car Dana has provisions for an automobile, such as self-adjusting rear brakes, the pinion snubber, the leaf springs are different. Uh, as soon as they got the rear end out where I could look at it, I realized that that's what it was, a truck rear end, which is still a good rear end, but you just have to make some modifications. This isn't a factory tab. Somebody welded, MIG welded that on there. Same thing for that tab right there, because trucks didn't use that. They wouldn't have had a purpose for that. One of the leaf springs was bent, so uh, the, it had the truck style leaf springs and some modified brackets to hold it in place. See, this has four bands that just go together, one, two, three, and four. I happen to have a nice set of the correct stacked leaf springs that would go underneath that car. That's a, that is a B-body, that's a Mopar Performance, but that's a B-body leaf spring. This is a leaf spring out of a truck. So I just donated them to the cause. I had a little bit of money in the estimate anyway to, to re-arc that leaf spring that was under the car. So I could go a little bit above and beyond and give them actually a pair of matching leaf springs that are right for the car. And then here's this brakes the poor guy was driving around on. And the rear brakes were completely worn out and falling apart. The meat was like an old overcooked turkey was falling off of the actual backing plate of the drums. So I also donated a complete rear brake job. He just bought the car from another place that said they did restorations, but I would never set something like that out. So I'm donating the entire rear brake overhaul so that I know that this car is safe, just to make sure that it's a safe car and that we do more than we get paid for. Just one of many things I do in the course of a day. The headliners in these NASCARs are tricky. If it was just a regular top 1970 Roadrunner, Larry could knock out that headliner in probably three or four hours. But these have the fast back on them. These have that plug that goes in the back. So that headliner runs from the very front all the way to the very back. And there's a lot of intricate turns. There's a lot of changes inside there that have to be adapted and, and accommodated for so that you have a good fit. You need good vendors, good subcontractors. Larry's a great example of that. Well, yesterday we got the Dana under our 70 Charger, got it off the frame rack, rolled it in the booth, and now we're getting ready to put the color inside the trunk. You know, one of the cool things that I thought Mopar did that the other manufacturers didn't do was they painted the engine compartment and they painted the trunk compartment the same color as the body. It's impossible to paint the inside of the trunk, the inside of the engine compartment at the same time you're painting the outside of the body for two reasons. One is you'd be dragging your hose from inside the trunk to the outside of the body while everything's still wet. Two is it would be a dirtier job on the outside of the car if you tried to do it at the same time. So you have to compartmentalize the engine compartment, trunk compartment, inside the cabin of the car and the outside, all of separate paint operations. The best feeling a painter ever has is when he slams that door for the last time and knows the rest is up to God. And this thing was complete rubbish when we got it because the whole back end was just pushed clear up to the back of the doors almost. 
It's been a really busy week. We got the 70 Superbird drivetrain, headlights, headliner, all installed. The Cooks 383 for their Barracuda convertible got painted beautiful corporate blue. And at long last, the 70 Charger collision job is near completion. If you're gonna do a quality job on a restoration or on any car in the way of painting, there are just certain things that have to happen. The most important is that the products that you're using are good quality products. They're not substandard products or something you got at the local auto parts store. Once that body work is done, once that filler's on there and the car's massaged out, it gets the primer. It gets two or three coats of the high build primer, then it gets block sanded. That takes out imperfections, waves, uh, movements in the body style lines that will show up with paint on them. Then it gets reprimered. Then after the reprimer, it gets blocked again. Those are all the steps that are necessary before you apply paint. Once that's ready, you mask the car, you make sure that everything that's supposed to have paint on it gets paint on it. Once that's ready, you mix up your sealer, you apply one to two coats of really nice sealer, then you're ready for your base coat, clear coat, walk away. best feeling a painter ever has is when he slams that door for the last time and knows the rest is up to God. Wow, that looks different. It's a lot better in the sunlight, man. Looks good outside. It detailed yeah, it up nice, didn't it? Yep. It's actually a nice it. color out here. The car turned out beautiful. I love that color in the sun. It really shines. What an improvement. Look at the car. It was actually, it was absolute rubbish when we got it. Now look at it now. It's absolutely stunning and beautiful. The owner has got to be ecstatic. The 70 Charger RTSC came to us about six months ago. Uh, it had gotten hit pretty hard in the rear end. The insurance company was going to total the car when the owner reached out to me to say, hey, what, what can I do? I don't want to lose my car. I got involved to find out that um, if I were able to keep my repair costs under a certain dollar amount, that we'd be OK to repair it. And that's what we did. I made some concessions. I called our friends at Auto Metal Direct and said, we got to work together. All that was required of us was just the collision work that was done to it. Is that mine? Yeah, where'd you find that at? In the back seat. Oh, yeah. Did you leave Yeah, it that there? was my fault. Anyways, so the only thing that was required of us to fix was the damage that it came in with. The back end was completely messed up. It was folded in like an accordion. He bought the car kind of sight unseen, so to speak. Like, he can't, doesn't have a crystal ball. He can look around inside it, right, and right. see what's underneath the paint. So when it gets rear-ended, we've got all this bondo that's busting off in great big chunks like that. So I acclimated him to the, the fact that the car was put together kind of not right. So we fixed a whole bunch of things that weren't part of the collision, didn't charge anybody to do it, just so that we could have the right car when we're done and stand behind it. Yeah. And that's what we that's we're great. Behind, aren't we? Auto Metal Direct made that car come back on the road. The reason being, one, they make the parts for it. People think of the replacement parts at AMD and, and Legendary and Tony's parts as restoration parts, but they can also be collision parts. This is a, a classic example of a rear end collision that went through insurance and got repaired and back to pre-loss condition. Of course, the, the frame was a little bit out of alignment. The guys fixed that. Eclipse makes the measuring system. We use that in this particular case to set the height and the length of the rails. We treated this job just like a regular collision job. Body men out there, they know what it's like. We treated this job the exact same way. We measured the unibody to make sure that it was square to its original specifications before we started welding up metal. Then we went through with our brand new AIM spot welder, beautiful piece of equipment. Spot welded every single spot on the car where it's supposed to be spot welded, and we MIG welded where we couldn't reach. That was the way it went. Everything is looking great on the car, and it's ready to go. Where's the... Where's the shifter boot or what's the deal? Didn't restore the car, Darren. Didn't restore the car. The Charger, as I've said before, was a collision job, no different than if you brought in a 1995 Honda Civic that was hit in the ass. I'm not gonna be responsible to detail under the hood of that car or to fix things on the car that are not associated with the lot. So as usual, you never quite finish them even when they go. No, I no, didn't Darren, get paid to do a restoration. Right? It's a collision job. I understand that. So what do you want me to do on you every collision put a job? Boot back on it? Don't, why don't I just go to the dealership and buy people new cars when they get wrecked? There's a lot of things on the car that, that aren't right. But we only did the collision work on the back part of the vehicle. There's a lot of stuff from the back of the doors forward that we didn't touch. It's, it's wrong. But that's something the owner can go ahead and take care of himself at his leisure. What's the deal with the tips? He wanted the 71 to 74 tips on it. That's what he had on it before. So he wanted us to put them back on, so we did. Are those, Comet accurate are those the same tips or used ones it. or new ones? Or no, they're the same tips that he had on. As soon as they get in the new machine gun tips, 
I'm gonna ship them to the guy. He's a mechanic, so he'll put those on himself. Same thing with the mirrors. He's paint, having his body shop there at the dealership he works at. They're gonna do the mirrors on it. Uh, that's why they're not on there right now. We detailed out the SE emblems, which I think looks pretty good. Is this missing some trim here? He wanted those taken off. He wanted the belt moldings taken off. And what's weird is all chargers had belt moldings. So we had to actually modify this piece. The piece he gave us was for like a uh, Roadrunner. It, it did not fit. It left too big of a gap. So that's the only that's way he could have it without belt moldings. He oh, wanted wow. it that way. All the body guys did a really good job putting it back together. Came out nice. All the lines fit real well. Overall, I believe the owner is going to love it. I think the body man did a great job on the car. Again, this thing was complete rubbish when we got it. You remember how hard it was hit? Because the whole back end was just pushed way up to the back of the doors almost. The frame rails, wheelhouses, floors, quarters, all that stuff was replaced. It took a hard hit. I'm proud of the body work they did on this car. That You know, these cars are hard to get flat. They, you know, they're brand new quarter panels, but they're not perfectly flat when we get them from Auto Metal Direct, so we have to make them flat. And the guys did a good job. There's good body fit, good flat panels, good alignment, nice paint work. It's cut and buffed back to original show type setup because it had been a cut and buffed car before. So really right now what you see is what he had before, but a lot better. And I only say that because the car had been touched by other people before who weren't as passionate about it. The rear floor had been sectioned together. We had a pile of scrap metal that was like three feet deep of showing all the sections of putting this car back together before we got our hands on it. The car had a left center punch that separated the floor from the outer uh, rocker it was that hard of a hit. Nobody replaced the, the window regular. We had to put a, I donated a used window regulator to the left quarter. None of that was part of the loss. But you assume some of that when you start doing collision work. In this particular case, this is a great guy who was really patient with us. All he wanted was his car done right and back, and that's what we did. And uh, the fact is, that's where it's at right now. And I'm proud of the guys. I think we did a great job here. The ghouls really didn't have a whole lot to do with it. It was mostly our body and paint guys and my, you know, signing off on all the expertise. Look at it. It was such a disaster when we got it. Look at it now. What an improvement. This is the kind of a car that when it's wrecked, needs restored. Somebody can actually see the before and the after pictures and really appreciate what's been done to the car. You know, it's a beautiful day outside. It's 100 degrees, and this thing just shines like, like the top of a lake on a sunny day. It's beautiful. Look at it. I love it. This is a car here that someone can enjoy. You can take this car out and drive it and have a good time with it. So right now what we have is we have a beautiful culmination of some of the best vendors in the world have brought a classic car that they're never gonna make this again. We brought that car back. We brought it back with Auto Metal Direct, with AIM, with Accurate Exhaust supplied the exhaust system for it. Everybody pitched together to get this car on the road again for our customer. But that's what we do at Graveyard Cars. That's what you do when you do something not for the money, but you do it for the passion. At Graveyard Cars, we do these cars for the passion. If we did it for the money, it would take all the fun and the love and the passion out of it. And that's not what I'm about. I'm just a street guy, you know? Born four, four blocks over is where I was raised. Four blocks from here right now. Never left, don't care to. I want to put as many of these cars back on the road as humanly possible in the time I have on this old earth. So that's the way she is. Next time on Graveyard Cars. The Hills will be here soon to pick up their 1970 Plymouth Superbird. Mark, how much time for the cars got to go down the road? Two and a half weeks. Wow. The final assembly has started and we're firing on all cylinders. We need to install the remaining decals, the wing, the bumper, tail lights, license plate lights, emblems, the seats, and we need to get the motor running. We also need to install the heater box and dash for the convertible Barracuda. We have a lot to do and we will get it done. Coming up next time on Graveyard Cars.